Oh, I'm not missing it. I've got it all over my arms and my face and my legs. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm in well, London. All right. Well, everybody, welcome to the show here. Uh, as I said, my name is Tom. This here is Jason Myers here of Audit Chain, the lead architect uh, of the Audit Chain, spearheading the effort to get the word out, especially from the London Society of Chartered Accountants, their fintech event uh, at an event, at a bit larger event that I'm unable to remember the initials for. I'm sure Jason will tell us all about it. Uh, but today we wanted to have Jason on to give an update on what we say uh, being live from London. Uh, there's been a lot of news about Binance and Coinbase uh, in the news. And uh, as if you've watched these episodes for a while now and have watched any of the other podcasts Jason's been on, he's talked about the SEC is bound by uh, their authority from Congress and by court decisions that bind them to what they're able to do. And Jason predicted it, what was coming. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to use nicer words. Their time has come, or their time will come, uh, and their time has come now. Uh, but uh, it, Jason, in the previous episodes, you talked a lot about uh, the SEC having uh, um, the need to do this because that is their mandate to do it. Whether or not you like Gary Gensler or you like the system or not, this was coming because they, the SEC believes that their law and their court decisions apply to crypto. Would I, that, is that a good summary of your position on it? It not only applies to crypto, but it applies to the SEC itself. It's not only the issuers of a thing where there's an expectation of a return, dependence upon the work of others, rel uh, reliance on the work of others, and uh, where there's a perceived to be a common enterprise, right? Um, the SEC is bound by SEC v. W. P. Howey just as much as an issuer is. And therefore, the issuer has to comply with securities laws and the SEC has to comply with securities laws, which means enforcing those laws. Right. Right. A lot of people say that, you know, the SEC is regulating through enforcement. You know, as much as I really want to agree with that, because it's, you know, it's my industry being attacked, they are, <laughs> they are enforcing existing regulations. They have no choice, right? And until that Supreme Court case is overturned, that's what we've got to deal with. And to make matters worse, right, to make matters worse, it conveniently places total control of crypto in the hands of the gatekeeper incumbent banks, right? Right. What is a gatekeeper? We've talked about gatekeepers before. Gatekeepers are banks, broker dealers, custodians, transfer agents, DTC, accounting firms, and law firms. They're, right? they're, they're, they're that cabal that, that works together to create this system. Yeah, if you're going to issue a security, you cannot get away from a law firm. You cannot get away from an accounting firm. Right. Right. And if you're hiring an investment bank to place the financing or the issuance, then they are a gatekeeper as well. Right. Well, if they're the if they're the, uh, the 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 gatekeepers and all that, and currently, much of the the uh, we'll call them just the crypto tokens in, uh, in general, those can be started by anybody. Uh, and I use the there's an example out there of a 12 year old that uh, set up a mining rig, mined a little ETH, and then started a uh, an ERC20 token, uh, and, and, and thus. A 12-year-old who is not under any jurisdiction in the United States at all as a legal entity uh, can create what they're deeming a security, and thus they're pushing rules to push it all back into that cabal of people that you're talking about, that you can't do that well, unless um, you follow those rules, correct? Let, let's just clarify that the 12-year-old kid, if he emitted tokens yep. and nobody made an investment decision, to get them then a case can be a defense i should say can be made but you know they're going after airdrops too right right There's noise about airdrops nobody makes a decision when they get an airdrop 
I don't even want these things because they, cl you know, they, they, they clutter they, up your wallet. All worth, yeah, they clutter my wallet. They're worthless and they're just meant to get you your attention and spam you, right? Yep. But um, yeah, so look, any company can issue its own securities and sell their own securities. You don't need a broker dealer, right? You should hire a law firm to draft the offering documents, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, there you go. And sooner or later, you're going to need an accounting firm to prepare financial, uh, bare minimum of financial disclosure to even if you're selling only to accredited investors, right? Under, you know, a popular exemption, Rule 506, right? Once you take on a single non accredited investor, then you've got substantially higher levels of financial disclosure, right? Now, keep something in mind, and just to put things in their proper perspective, 70 to 80% of securities law compliance for issuers of securities is financial disclosure, financial and operational disclosure, risk disclosure, right? So, and the thing is, you know, I learned 30 years ago, people want what they can't have, and they all want what's dangerous for them. They're not going to read it anyway. My first attorney on the first deal I ever did, they're not going to read it anyway. Take that chance to warn them as much as possible. Right? Right. And they'll even respect you for it. So the, anyway. All right. Go, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Uh, in, in this, uh, in, in the past couple of days in seeing uh, the SEC go at it, uh, we also had the CFTC go with the House Agriculture Committee asking for a larger budget uh, in order to take on uh, regulating the commodities aspect of crypto. We know there was a court decision helping the SEC uh, be the arbiter of what's a security and what's a commodity. Uh, but the, the uh, chairman, uh, Rostin Benham, went in front of the House Agricultural Committee, which for viewers... Uh, regulates the futures industry because futures originated with the coffee, sugar, cocoa, and pork bellies things. Um, for more authority to, to regulate crypto and actually to take a lot of it uh, away from the SEC or at least out of the SEC's hands because the CFTC is actually a day to day regulator of markets. Um, uh, and there is very receptive in the House uh, because the, the current Republican group wants to see crypto. Um, you know, prosper more than the, the other party does. But uh, he, he made a very good case about talking about how he does things for regulation purposes and the SEC does things uh, to fund their budget. The, S the CFTC doesn't take their fines and use them. They give it back to the Treasury on an $8 to $1 ratio. But the SEC uses their funds to fund their budget. And I know, Jason, you've spoken about that a lot in the past. Um, how, how, do you, how do you see that the, the SEC... Uh, I guess my question is, if they're fighting to keep this power of the SEC and to do all of this, uh, are they trying to just to keep their budget so they stay in that cabal of regulators? Uh, or are they? would you say they're open to letting the CFTC take some of this on? on? The SEC regulates futures, and they, reg they spot markets are not regulated by the CFTC, right? Right. But if you take... Uh, a market like, for instance, your, uh, there are several futures contracts on Bitcoin. Um, those are regulated by the CFTC, right? How many right. different types of futures are, are going to be introduced, right? Now, the moment you take those futures and you wrap them up in an ETF, that is the SEC's jurisdiction. <laughs> It is right. a quagmire. Right. So um, I don't know if it's any more than grandstanding. Uh, they want to scream as loud as possible to make sure the American public hears them. Right. It could right. also be a tactic to get a bigger budget allocation out of Senate Banking Committee. Right. Budget appropriations. Um, because if the SEC or the CFTC is unable to pay its bills, they got to go before appropriations and get that money, right? Which the CFTC was just begging for. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to watch, right? So, um, you know, because 
they represent the American people, those committees, or so they say. But, um, you know, you want money from the American taxpayer. How do you justify us allocating X amount of dollars, right? And then you can imagine how that testimony goes, right? When it comes to the SEC, um, like I said, they have no choice. And, you know, I, I, what I think is very controversial, the thing is it comes from 30 years of experience dealing directly with them as an underwriter of securities, right? I mean, your lead banker is the one that is a liaison between the rest of the deal team and the Securities and Exchange Commission, along with your in-house and external counsel, right? Right. And it's a prosecution. If you're filing a full-blown registration statement, it's a prosecution, right? Like a patent prosecution, Yeah. right? You have tw uh, they have 20 days to respond with comments, and they always do. And then you've got 20 days to cure them, right? 20 business days, right? And then when there's no more left, the SEC declares it effective. They do not approve or disapprove it. It's declared effective when the staff feels there's adequate disclosure and investors are protected, right? Informed, right? Not protected. Because the SEC's got body bags, not stethoscopes. <laughs> but my, my, my opinion is this. You have Howie that is sitting, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It, it, it is the brick wall that innovation hits. There will be no new regulations and no regulatory innovation, no amendment of existing rules and no new rules unless and until crypto is under the complete control of the SEC incumbent gatekeeper community. Full well, stop. We're, we're seeing that happen. Um, in, in fact, that gives me a, a good uh, time to bring up the, uh, ironically, yesterday, uh, a group uh, was uh, given a license by uh, a group called Prometheus. Are you uh, familiar with this group that just received a license to trade a, uh, uh, it's not, it, not an AT, it's an ATS, it's not an automatic trading system, but a, uh, alternative trading system uh, for crypto. It's an ATS, You're right. FINRA, FINRA authorizes you to do that, right? You register at a broker, uh, as a broker dealer with the SEC, right? Right. And then you got to get your membership agreement from FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, right? FINRA, uh, under Rule 1014, examines the necessary personnel you have that has the supervisory experience. They look at your compliance and supervisory uh procedures manual uh, they examine the systems the facilities with which you're going to carry out that business and they add it to your membership agreement which gets signed by the firm and by FINRA right that right. membership agreement permits you to conduct certain lines of business uh, the, the ATS is one of them an ATS is an exchange that's exempt from 34 act registration as an exchange but you must be a broker dealer right there is no way out of that gatekeeper architecture uh well that 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 makes a, a lot of sense what prometheus did is it's a, apparently they've been trying for about five years to or pro, I, i'm saying prometheus it's prometheum um uh, they've been trying five years. It's a group of, uh, I'll just say, Wall Street lawyers uh, that and former regulators that got together to try and, and this is the story on the internet about them, not my knowledge about it. They got together in order to get something registered and get and see if they can get something through the system, uh, and, and they did. Uh, and it says, uh, their, their Twitter page says, Prometheum building the world's first SEC and FINRA registered full service market for digital asset securities, issuance trading clearly, clearing settlement and custody uh and uh um and they managed to get all of that uh i believe it was two days ago that did either we it don't was either one day ago or yesterday unless you're reading the membership agreement itself you know we, we don't know what they got for sure right 
Only the membership agreement tells you what they have. You can also go on broker check and look and see uh, some of the lines of business, right? And all the principles and so on and so forth. Right. If you put it up on the screen, it says, as the first SEC registered dig digital asset qualified custodian, Promethium Ember Capital's focus on the federal securities laws provides customers with protections they deserve. And the, uh, the, the picture, if you can read that, says, as a qualified custodian, Promethium Ember Capital has to comply with the SEA 15C 3-3 customer protection rules. Uh, so, so they're, pr they're promoting it. Are, hold on one second. These are very general terms. When you throw around SEA 15C-3 and you use the word customer protection, that is a blanket statement. 15C <laughs> covers net capital, the required capital that you have to have in order to comply with net capital rules, right? All right. Well, so, someone's getting it, and we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll track we'll track that um, uh, going forward uh, to see if they're actually able to track. I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be going after working with groups like J.P. Morgan's Onyx system and trying to get in, in, involved in those larger institutional. Uh, we'll call them just call them money flows, uh, but uh, and I I really don't think that this group, uh, since they're set up by uh, lawyers and former regulators, are going after retail clients on that type of stuff. I, I bet the institutional play is coming here. And you don't know, but in order to go after retail clients, that has to be submitted in their 1017 application, right? 1017 is a FINRA rule, right? That's when you start a new broker dealer or you change control of an existing broker dealer. Gotcha. Oh, there's this a lot of interesting tweets about this. They kind of snuck in. They snuck in under under the radar there while the the, the news was coming down about uh, uh, Binance and Coinbase. Uh, as we said, their their time uh, has come, and their time has come. Is uh, how do you see this the the Binance and Coinbase the issues resolving themselves? Do you do you think this is something that the big chunk of money that coughed up by both parties will solve, or is the SEC inclined to, you know, take it and ban them? Look, these two lawsuits are they're, they're federal lawsuits like any other lawsuit, right? Uh, the same uh, federal rules of civil procedure. Um, yes, I think it's civil. Pro yes, civil procedure apply. Um, they are a defendant. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the SEC is a plaintiff like anybody else, right? right? Um, they don't have their own forum for dispute resolution like FINRA does, right? And their own forum for enforcement actions. They use the federal courts to do it. Um, and, you know, look, it comes down to who can outspend who, right? <laughs> In this case, it's probable that the SEC can outspend Coinbase. And to the extent that CZ wants to commit suicide for the betterment of society maybe <laughs> maybe binance can outspend the sec because remember they got to go and get money from budget appropriations right because if they blow their budget then they got to go get more they got to go get more money now ripple on the other hand they've got a lot of money well not only do they have they have a billion in cash which is not a lot of money Right. It's a lot for but the law firms, though. They can mint more XRP and turn it into U.S. dollars than the SEC can get dollars out of appropriation. Right. I was telling a journalist last night that we should do a piece about how Howie stands in the middle between the SEC, who has an obligation to comply with Howie and the issuers. Right. And how it's a slippery slope. If in a perfect world, Ripple would lose at the Southern District, lose at the second department and go all the way to the Supreme Court and win, right? Then, then we have a change on our hands. Well, I was explaining there's a scene in The Godfather, part two, and they're on the roof. Hyman Roth is retiring. He's cutting the cake. And Michael tells the story. He says, on my way here, I saw a rebel being arrested by police 
And right. rather than being taken alive, he exploded a grenade and took the policeman with him. Hyman Roth says, what does that tell you? And Michael simply says, they can win. Right. Right. The sum of all wisdom is, you know, the Godfather is the sum of all wisdom. Everybody knows that. But it was a really, <laughs> really good analogy because Ripple and Binance can explode a grenade, take them all with them, and possibly, possibly win in the highest court in the land and possibly overturn Howie for the betterment of society or the advancement of innovation and break the other thing is separately is break the gatekeeper economic dictatorship that has a stranglehold on well, not only the United States, but the world. The, the other way of doing it is getting a receptive uh, Congress and president. You know, we can we can. No, uh, no, <laughs> no. It's just not going to happen. You can't just know. You can't just do that. You have a case at bar handed down from the highest court in the land. Right. It's a well, law. that I know, but just, but you know, but that 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 away. case could be made moot if they change change like the law. Like Roe v. Wade, like Roe v. Wade was made moot. I'm sorry, I don't mean to get people in a kerfuffle, but that's right. what happened with Roe v. Wade. Another case came down and overturned. I'm not going to go into the technical matters of law that gave effect to the cancellation of Roe v. Wade, but that's what happened. Right. And it took right. it took 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 50 years. Right. <laughs> so if Ripple makes it all the way up, that that clock starts the moment a petition is. It actually starts the moment the judges agree to hear it. Right. The Supreme Court agrees to hear it. Right. Now, they'd have to take a, uh, a case like that. I mean, I'll quote Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They respond not to the weather of the day, but the climate of the era. Actually, she was citing somebody else. I forget who. But the point is, is that, I mean, this is a hearable case. This is in, pu in the public interest. And it's about the advancement of society. Right. Which that's what the Supreme Court does. Slow right. And steady. Well, one of the difference was uh, that, that I, I see is that the, the, the Roe case, you know, dealt in constitutional issues of rights, which has a different, uh, it applies differently than just deciding the business of a civil lawsuit uh, on how certain parts of past congressional law apply now. And, well, and no so past Supreme Court cases at bar that rule mm -hmm. turn out, right? So if you go back to the case, SCCVWP Howie, you have to consider those nine judges. Who are they going to be overturning? Right? What was the condition of the country at the time? They'll examine how securities disclosure was sent through the mail. Wasn't available on the internet. Right? Things don't happen instantaneously back then. It didn't right. happen. They do now. Right? We didn't live in an open ledger based investment society like we do now, right? Like we do now. In fact, if I were one of those nine judges, I'd be looking at MicroStrategy, which is a traditional entity hidden behind a periodic disclosure framework whose 90% of their assets are open ledger based assets right so i can't Bitcoin. look through the first veil i can't look through the first veil i can only look quarterly through the second veil but the first the third veil is an asset that i can see move between wallet addresses upon block confirmations right so you're hiding an open ledger based asset behind a periodic disclosure framework contained within a traditional entity Right. Which is another way of saying that you're hiding value that is otherwise con you're, you're concealing publicly viewable value that would otherwise be concealed behind the firewalls of uh, custody, bank custody environments and accounting information systems. Right. 
I'm getting into real technical stuff. I don't want to lose the audience. No, but... it, it's it's good though. It's good though because people need to under uh, understand this. And it and also each time you bring up a topic like that, it, I write it down and accuse me for a future conversation to do a little research and expand upon it in a way people can understand. And in debating Supreme Court decisions or going through them here is not really the the focus of this show. It's it's whether or not Binance and Coinbase are going to get out of this alive. Uh, or not. And, uh, uh, you know, the gen if you read the internet, it's, I mean, Gary Gensler's Twitter page, uh, it, it's, it's, it's the funniest, the funniest comments ever. Cause ever, as you might suspect, not, there's not a single supporter in that list. No, I mean, people, he's got accused of no soul. I mean, I call him the grim reaper. I mean, the, the memes are outrageous. They're, they're yeah. great. I mean, they, there's a lot, there's serious entertainment I know on there. One going around where, uh, yeah. It might actually be old. It's one from Goodfellas where they're kicking Joey Bats in the bar, right? <laughs> and Robert De Niro's, you know, swinging his arm in circles. <laughs> and one is uh, Ripple, and you don't see Joey Bats, but they point to the SEC on the floor. <laughs> Joey Bats. <laughs> <laughs> the, the knife in the trunk. <laughs> right, as a last measure. All right, let, let me let me take a, a, a moment here. Uh, we have a, a nice crowd on, on LinkedIn uh, uh, watching us, and thank you for everyone uh, watching. If you're on LinkedIn, drop a comment, and I'll put it on the screen, and maybe we'll get uh, Jason to address it here. And if you know his triggers, drop those too, and uh, we'll really get the conversation going. <laughs> um, uh, but but thank you uh, for those of you watching on uh, on both YouTube uh, and LinkedIn on our live version here. Um, a lot of times we record these things in advance, uh, which go go very smoothly. Uh, and a lot of times we, we we do them live and they don't go smoothly. But this one's going smoothly. And if you're watching on the replay, uh, feel free to drop comments in the the uh, the chat boxes below on YouTube, on the comment section below, or in LinkedIn over on the side. Uh, and I'll monitor those and we'll get back to you later or address them on another episode of On the Brink. Uh, but those of you watching on LinkedIn, uh, let us know. Let us know your thoughts, and if you have a question, feel free to leave them here. Uh, anyway, that uh, that brings us brings us back to uh, what you're doing in London. Uh, Jason, can you give us a little background on uh, on why you're in London uh, for Audit Chain? Uh, well, I'm here to support the new king, and uh, well, I'm just <laughs> um... God save the king. <laughs> uh, so tomorrow is a. Uh, the London Society of Chartered Accountants is hosting uh, their annual fintech event at the um, Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, which is actually a building, Chartered Accountants Hall in the city. Um, so uh, I'm on a panel there. On the 15th, there is an infrastructure conference uh, sponsored by the guys from Blocks. Okay. Uh, that I'm going to be um, talking at. Um, and then uh, I do want to give a shout out to my uh, my good buddy, James Bowater. Um, Crypto AM turns five years old and the summer solstice event is held on the 21st um, in Canary Wharf. So uh, if you're in London, definitely check it out. I don't, uh, I'm don't. i sure you can get tickets somewhere, somehow. Um, and then um, there is the uh, Posh event at the Hurlium uh, Club <laughs> in Fulham, in Fulham uh, on the 23rd, which is put on by House of Block, which is run by uh, its the founder. House of Block. Corby, Corby yeah. Uh, that's going to be a really, really cool event. So, you know, these are intimate, must-attend events, um, the last two. And then uh, I'm chewing on two other events that uh, I'm waiting for confirmation on, right? So, but because of the times we're living in and the domain we're addressing, um, you know, they all want me to speak now. <laughs> Nobody wanted to hear from me three years ago, two years ago. Nope. They're like, yeah. let us just do our stuff and get away yeah. regulators and people bring in structure to the industry. So that that that's a good uh, segue into this question that I had uh, written down and, uh, and other people have asked me as a lead up to this event. Uh, with the regulation, with the 
the environment you see now in, in the, the digital aspect, digital asset world, fintech world, and everything towards, we'll just call it distributed ledger stuff, otherwise known as crypto, uh, and other projects um, based on uh, on blockchains. Uh, how does an event like this, and uh, event meaning the the regulatory climate, and specifically what you're doing in London, how does that advance the audit chain? Uh, protocol and, and the software does it is it giving it, they're wanting you is this now showing them the way that all right if you're going to have structure in the markets uh you need structure underneath in the under the hood too and that's audit chain are you getting that feeling also well let's according to coin market cap there are twenty five thousand five hundred and fifty four things that flicker on a ticker right <laughs> Be they tokens, base layer, digital currencies like Bitcoin, um, and Ethereum used for gas, right? Matic used for gas, which SEC says is security, which is they're probably right because there's a group of people that have keys to that layer too, right? Right. Um, so if, assuming they're all going to comply with securities laws in the United States, which they won't, <laughs> um, but some of them will, some of them will, uh, financial machine readable financial reporting is mandatory. There's no way out of it. Right. Um, why we talk in London? Well, we're going after accountants. We're going after organizations. Uh, we're going after infrastructure providers. Um, and we're going after investors, right? So. Uh, and we are going after regulators, as I had said, uh, I believe it was last week. Um, but uh, again, you know, these are separate jurisdictions. Uh, these influ uh, these jurisdictions are influenced by the United States, right? Um, because every other jurisdiction has U.S. law to comply with when it comes to anti-money laundering and identifying who your customers are, right? Otherwise, you get kicked off the SWIFT system if you don't comply, right? So, um, uh, which is otherwise known as sanctioned, right? And if you get kicked off of the SWIFT system, you're an island. Can't get off. Nobody can get on. Otherwise so, known as Iran, <laughs> Russia. Right. North Korea. Uh, yeah. So, um, y y it's hard to directly correlate the two when it comes to jurisdictional issues. I think that was your question, right? Uh, sorry, my great studio here butts up against the road and the noisy truck can't escape it. Um, yeah, that, that basically a, a addresses my question. Uh, as, as you know, I get a lot of questions about, um, um, you know, how, pertain as like a sometimes I act as like a bridge between you and the audit chain community for getting questions answered. Uh, they wanted to know the question is if you're going to be seeing blocks uh, this week at the show, say when is blocks going to have a, a little infrastructure for us to uh, test around with? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a better idea. Well, they gave us, you know, we, they're wiring up the infrastructure that allows anyone to just spin up, Apache only node. And for any DevOps engineer out there listening, you know, it's not a trivial thing to create that infrastructure that automates and orchestrates the virtualization of a number of different containers, all of which are needed in order to perform what we're talking about, which is spinning up Apache only node, right? You got right. two Docker, two Docker containers. Those Docker containers are within another virtual machine on a server, right? Unless you're getting a dedicated server, right? And that's going to be up to the end, uh, you know, the people running nodes, accounting firms are going to want dedicated servers, right? They're going to want SOC reports. They're going to want IAC 3402 reports. They want certification. They need certification, right? It's the law that they have certification, right? So. It's not as trivial as people make it out to be. Uh, no, not at all. And, and getting the infrastructure right 
it's one thing if you're setting up infrastructure to run a gaming server. Uh, it's totally, totally another thing to set it up in order to run uh, uh, financials uh, and, and, and parse financial information where you got to get it right. <laughs> and so it's not uh, only that, but information that may not be published yet can't be leaked to other servers or the public. Right. So there's security measures that have to be that have to be taken. You know, that's a good point. I, ha I hadn't thought of that. So the, the certifications and security have to be. Uh, and I don't know what the regulations are for that, but they have to take into account that you're processing non-public information. Yeah, that's right. Five years ago, I remember, I'll never forget it. The Edgar system got hacked. Right. 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 The SEC's Edgar system got hacked. People got access to material non-public information and they traded on it. It's the funniest thing in the world. I, I think, didn't that go to court? And the court said, hey, you put it on the servers. The fact that you remember. didn't intend for it to be like, it's, it was still public. And so everyone got I to keep their money. I don't, I, I don't remember. No, public information, I, there, there, there is a qualification to public information. It has to be absorbed by the public, right? You don't just roll up a window shade and say, it's public and close it, <laughs> right? Because how many people are going to actually see that? The right, public none. will see it. So anyway. All right. And, and how about uh, just a quick summary of the, uh, the, the, the final development efforts of the, uh, the front end for Pacioli uh, and Luca? You mentioned in previous episodes that you were um, uh, still working on those. So, so you have something that's, that, that accountants around the world can use easily because they're busy doing their accounting. They don't need to be trying to figure out something new. Uh, uh, and how are the efforts for uh, development, software development uh, finishing up here as we present this to customers? Uh, it, they're coming along, right? Um, we're going to get an additional front end, uh, additional front end resources uh, after the raise, but also, you know, uh, a regulatory client's going to have a lot to say about it, right? Once you get a regulatory client, you're going to start to get accounting firms, right? One doesn't necessarily mean that you don't get the other, but um, they're going to have something to say about it. The enterprise is going to have something to say about it, right? A CFO is going to want exactly that. I don't want to have to code up XBRL. How do I do this so that my grandmother, if I hire her, can create a set of compliant financial statements that are accurate and reliable? So when we launch with a customer, they're going to have a great impact over the final look and feel and functionality of the front end, because right. that's pro that's part of product that's part of product acceptance. Well, you'll you'll see you'll get feedback and you'll see which you know which well, iterations it's not only work. Feedback, but you specify what changes need to be made to satisfy them, and then you make them. Right. Right. So then you document. I, I do have a question from social media here. Um, the The question is, and I'm guessing it's a result of this regulation and because Audit Chain is also has its protocol on the blockchain. Uh, is Audit Chain potentially a regulated entity? By who? Uh, this is all I got. I, I'm guessing yeah. because you have a token or, or something so, like that. Um, Audit Chain Labs is based in Switzerland, right? And uh, we don't take U.S. people. Um, we're not auditors, so we don't have to register as auditors. Um, we don't have accountants giving opinions. We're not bookkeepers. We're a technology platform. Right. Which, outside the United States, represents the lowest burden of clients, right? In Dubai, uh, there is a license granted for every single entity, whether you open a barber shop, a spaghetti factory, or a financial intermediary, right? But that's just part of corporate formation, right? But you do have obligations you have to meet every year, just like you've got obligations when you form a company in Delaware or Nevada or Wyoming. Right. Right. What what about on the uh, on the the, the Pacioli side the Pacioli side, uh, in which corporations have to buy in order to pay the gas and to, to use it they have to use the uh, the audit chain token is that uh, um, could that possibly get wrapped up in any of these 
you know, um, SEC, CFT arguments? If you want me to make a declaration <laughs> that there's no regulation, no, uh, I know. <laughs> I do that no way, especially not in this environment, right? I think there was a book that flew across the room. Our council just threw a book at me. We've lost Jason. The biggest risk in any crypto pod project, one of the biggest risks, is regulatory risks. Right. Coinbase did not disclose that after the SEC declares their registration statement effective, right, that they would not be. Well, they may have disclosed it. I'd have to read it. Regulatory risk is a very real and a, a, a potential risk. It's a probable risk. It's not a. I mean, sooner or later, it may materialize. To what extent? That's a whole other conversation. Look, what we're the doing is unprecedented, right? The, uh, the whole space, what we are doing is unprecedented, right? Ten years ago, if you would have told me <clears throat> that a $6 billion a year operation in fixed costs, a market-making operation, right, would, would only require less than 20 people with a budget <laughs> of less than $10 million a year, I, you know, I would have, you know, I would have laughed at you. Well, that's one of the that's things that I, I keep, I keep that's going back in conversations with people about this in that the, the rules as they're set up, the gatekeepers, the cabal of law firms, everybody that we're talking about here requires a lot of people to, to, to do everything that the government wants you to do because for a hundred years, it's required a lot of people to do it. I mean, you just needed all those people to do it. You needed lawyers, you needed accountants, you needed a staff in your own company, large to handle just doing your operations. You needed people to run pieces of paper around. You needed a huge budget. Now, you don't need a huge budget. You need to pay the lawyers still to get regulated, to, to register and all that. But, but to run your $6 billion company, you don't. You just need 20 people you know, sitting in their gym shorts uh, or their underpants uh, doing it. They may not be doing that's it a, well, but they're doing that's it. That's a technical distinct. No, they're doing it. it. Are you kidding me? Uniswap has changed the world. My oh, I was referring to FTX. Items, man. <laughs> Forget FTX. That's not a DeFi. That was a that was a TradFi platform with no. I don't want to talk about that. Right, but you're right. <laughs> Uni Uniswap <laughs> is not a large organization. It doesn't have a big a big footprint. Uh, in employees or, or overhead, but they're a massive market. Oh, why didn't that come up? I had a I had a, <coughs> uh, a quote about Uniswap there, and I just erased it from the screen. Anyway, you're right, though, is that ten years ago you wouldn't you would could not possibly think that uh, that this would happen, or, or that just small groups of people uh, could start a project that it, literally two or three people that now require a huge amount of money or, or potentially require a huge amount of money to register with the SEC. Uh, whereas, you know, two weeks ago, they just did it. And all of a sudden their project's worth, you know, $20 million and they sell it to one of the incumbents out there and they walk away with the money uh, without ever getting registered. <laughs> Speaking of which... If if push comes to shove, a Coinbase will not be an independent entity. I actually see them being bought by an incumbent SEC gatekeeper bank. I, I totally agree with that. I don't know how I their fun, their shares are one. structured, but it could easily be a takeover target. I think it'll be a blue one from a branding perspective. I think it'll be a blue bank. <laughs> it's easy for the banks to do that. They got they got the money. And while Coinbase is worth a lot, it's not it's down huge. Their total value is down a lot. And uh, you know, that that can be seen as an intentional play by the banks to help push use their efforts to help push the the, the market and the regulations against them to lower their price, and then they buy them cheap. That's what they're doing. You you think that's not what they're doing? <laughs> I get persecuted on LinkedIn that I lack humility and the nuance. <laughs>
for complexity. This is not complex at all. It's a gargantuan industry that owns and operates its main regulator. Right. And there's a Supreme Court case on their side, which seals and locks in the juices and the flavors of that gatekeeper architecture. It's, people it's, don't it's, people don't the, realize the uh, uh, the people think the well one of the issues and that m most people that follow government regulators and you've brought up on this podcast uh, in the past is the fact that the employment door swings both ways between the SEC uh, and the major banks. People work at the banks for a while, then they go work at the regulators, uh, and they and then they go work at, back at the banks. It's no different than uh, junior associates at a junior partners at a law firm leaving to go work for their major clients. Uh, to ensure that everyone's on the same page. And then later uh, that that lawyer comes back and works for the firm again, and they assign another junior client over there, uh, and, and everything is one nice big employment circle uh, and keeps everything running smoothly. Uh, and in that, in, that's, a, in essence, what the large banks and the SEC do. And if you Google the term SEC revolving door, <laughs> there'll be an unlimited number of hits that talk exactly about that. Right. Yeah, there, there, Pogo, there's a there's Pogo. a couple comments about <laughs> Pogo put out a good one a couple years ago about the revolving door. Uh, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to I, I'm trying to find the one that I uh, I just I just had about that. I heard even person. former sec commissioners themselves have given speeches about this that are written on paper that are on the internet in pdf and in typical internet form sec's failures as a government organization will cause your meme coin to pump to astronomical heights and of course can't see it really well on the screen here but that picture is of the gensler meme coin <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Talk about talk about sticking the poker in his eye. Every time he makes a decision, this project pumps like crazy. Good <laughs> Barry. <laughs> uh, you can't make this stuff up, really. You know what really pisses me off? Do tell. How you can make statements like you don't need digital currencies. We have them. It's called the U.S. dollar. You and it's mostly digital now money? anyway. Right. So. I don't know if he's retiring or, you know, how could you make I mean, if you're planning a career move after the SEC, how do you make public statements like that? Look, don't be surprised if he starts working for J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs. It goes back to Goldman, right? He could just go take his pick. They'll pay him. Of course they'll pay him. Anyway. All right. So we got two questions here from the audience. Uh, well, two questions from one person. Let's uh, put them up. They're all kind of on topic. I uh, thought we'd start. Uh, first question, if the SEC asked for help right now, would Audit Chain be accepting this? Do, do you think there's a, any, any way in which the, uh, the government would reach out to a private organization uh, on something like this to help? The only help they're going to need is building higher fences around their building, the Capitol building, the White House. <laughs> because if this keeps going the way it's going, it's going to make January 6th look like a kumbaya song. Well, all they need is a, a presidential candidate that is, has two two things. One, it su supports the crypto world, and two, is actually electable. Well, uh, there, there are two. Um, and I'm not endorsing anybody yet. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., his father and his uncle were killed for being anti-Fed. Right. But, you know, they were killed. But, you know, his uncle was killed by a sink. I don't want to get into the single bullet theory. Uh, <laughs> only idiots believe that. But anyway, um, he's pro Bitcoin. He's anti Fed. He's a consumer advocate like Ralph Nader was. Right. Right. And 
you know, he he's all about vaccine safety, right? Um, I can't say he's an anti-vaxxer because there's no evidence to that effect, but he is certainly a consumer advocate. Well, that's true. He's one. Um, I don't know if DeSantis is one. I think he's just grandstanding. He's a total grandstander, in my opinion. He's vindictive I, and revengeful, and I, that's not; those are not good qualities of a leader. And anyone that does a pulls a U turn this election, I will I won't believe. Right? Oh, now I believe in Bitcoin. Right? Right. I, I can't. I just. I. I can't. Right. Jack Dorsey just announced Robert uh, endorsed Robert uh, RFK Jr. That's interesting. Right. And look, there were there will be a lot of elderly people in this country that will vote for him. Why? Because they want to see Camelot come back. There's still I a lot of old see- people that talk about it. I, I would like to see it, too. God, the world loved us then. We could do no yeah. wrong, even though we were bombing countries like crazy and invading other countries and the, under the cover of the CIA and meddling in everyone's affairs in South America. We were still loved everywhere because of this, uh, you know, this great marketing campaign we had. <laughs> Now it's just bad news all the time. Uh, we got we got another question here. Uh, uh, also, uh, Jason talked about Uniswap. Would Audit Chain consider something like work together with Uniswap? Do these types of I guess the question be, could be more thing. Could could it be possible, or is that the technology doesn't work that way? It's not that the technology doesn't work that way. It's a decentralized protocol. You don't need an audit firm to verify with tools that are not as superior as the contract technology that proves the state of the contract, meaning there's a million dollars of USDT and a million dollars worth of whatever the other side of the pair is, right? You don't need an auditor for that. It's self-evident. It's self-auditing. It's the proof of state is in the code and in how it compiles and gets executed, right? Um, If you're talking about the Uniswap Foundation itself that garners revenue from that platform, that's a different story. Right, that's different. Right? And just to put things in their proper perspective, everybody says, yes, it's a DeFi protocol. Um, The first question I ask if I were a regulator is I would send out as many subpoenas as possible. Eventually I'm going to get to someone that had access to or possession custody and or control over the DNS settings for the domain name that renders that, 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 uh, resolves the front end that you interact with those contracts with. Right. Right. And therein lies reliance upon uh, the work of others, right? If you look at it from a Howie perspective. Unless they block all U.S. IP addresses, right? With a very, very sophisticated scheme that for sure blocks not only U.S. IP addresses, but is able to detect if a U.S. IP address is being pinged off of a second jurisdiction's IP address, like what happens with a VPN, right? Yeah, then you get in, you start getting into First Amendment quagmires then too. Those cases are working their way through the system as well. But if you are Hayden Adams and you don't want to have anything to do with the SEC, that's what you'll do. Unless you're the rebel who wants to explode a grenade and take the police officers with him. <laughs> Right. It, it's possible. Note for the great you know, YouTube reviewers, we were like talking that. about the movie Godfather 2 there. <laughs> oh, the, the, the Gensler tweets just keep coming. They keep coming. <laughs> All right. So uh, just to expand upon uh, Henry's uh, thing, I was referring to buying AUDT to use the auto chain protocol. I guess uh, Jason very rarely speculates in those types of things, but... Uh, I'll let him answer that question if he wants. Well, again, why would they use it? It's a decentralized protocol. Right? 
Anyone who would use Audit Chain is anyone who would not pass the Howey test. No one's against regulations. People are against SEC broad statements that create so much FUD that crashes markets and creates uncertainty and fear, uh, which we saw yesterday and the two days ago, the, the markets dumped after, uh, after these announcements. But the markets came right back. Uh, but what people forget about, so people are like, well, whatever, the markets went down, went back up. What people forget is because of their the SEC's announcements, a lot of people got stopped out on uh, on orders and lost and lost money because of that. And people are angry about that. <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not protecting investors. And I'll tell you a story about how my investors were not protected by FINRA. Right? We had made a subordinated loan under a regulated subordinated loan agreement, which is a FINRA document that you cannot change. Right? Unless you get FINRA's approval. Right? We loan money. It came due, and uh, we had a uh, uh, we lost the document. Right, this was over ten years ago, and we asked Finra for a copy of it. No response. Three notices. No response. Every week, I would ask for a copy of it. When I finally got it, there was a clause that says if you don't give affirmative notice that you're not renewing the loan then it extends for three more years. And my investors lost their money because of FINRA's actions or inactions, I should say. Interesting. I thought I, I was under the impression that this could also be a trigger for you. I thought FINRA was more on the side of uh, the everyday people and helping people, but it seems to be also a bureaucratic organization that that doesn't want to be a nurturing group. I'm not taking the bait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was, it could have been, that could have been six hours of conversation right there. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that people are saying in the comments, uh, Coinbase's alleged failures deprive investors of critical protections, including rule books that prevent fraud and manipulation proper disclosure, safeguards against conflicts of interest. Uh, speaking from the, I watched Brian Armstrong earlier on CNBC talk about this, and they said that he basically in a roundabout way said, look, when they started, they had very little controls on what was going on. But in their lead to going public, uh, they instituted all sorts of controls. Uh, and, and as he said, they're a modern company with a modern audited properly and modern controls and all these types of things to a point where the the sec uh, approved them going public and we know the sec doesn't prove your product you know if you're legal to sell cannabis in colorado then you can go public uh but if if they approved i guess this is coming into a question for you if the sec says all right everything's great we approve it your disclosure is great your everything's fine how does that lead then lead lead them down the road to prosecution it's a quite it's it's confusing to a lot of people and do you have any insight on yeah, that but at if, all if, if, if you if you look past the details and focus on the big picture you have a multi-trillion dollar industry that owns and operates its main regulator and there's a Supreme Court case that fortifies the probability or guarantee, depending upon who you are, on which day, that crypto will be under the complete total control of the gatekeeper incumbent community. Right. So, so, yeah, comments about we'll people complaining about public. that. Let's let them out of the box. And then once they get enough money in the bank, they start earning money. We'll take half their runway in fines and at the same time hand it to a city or a Morgan Stanley or whoever in a, a you know, a take under, if you will. And one of the things they're talking about in their charges was, uh, I'm not sure First what you're on second. Don't say me. I didn't approve anything. You means the SEC and they don't uh approve anything. They declared the registration statement effective. 
I, I, I should have clarified this was the person was addressing uh, uh, Gary Gensler's the comments You're about the Gary Gensler. Of hypocrisy. <laughs> Listen, write a letter to Jamie Dimon, Brian Monahan, and the CEOs of all of the incumbent banks, along with the CEOs of every money manager that owns 10% or more of a gatekeeper. I don't think you'll get any response from them. No. Banks control the world. Everybody knows that. Banks control the world. And I think it was Rothschild himself. I care not about a country's laws. He who makes its money or is able to print its money controls the country. He's, as, I, as I reported, uh, he is the kingpin for market manipulation. And Gensler is killing crypto's future in the U.S. one company at a time. They're not killing it. They're handing it to the gatekeeper community, right? So instead of Uniswap, it'll be J.P. Morgan or Bank of America or all of them in a cooperative. And everyone will run a node on a layer two permissioned environment. And there'll be no difference between what you see on Uniswap in terms of functionality and what you see on on, on, on their platform, whatever that is. Right. This the, is a uh, fight to the death. <laughs> People need to get that through their heads, man. You're talking about the nature of money, the programmability of money, and the programmability of decentralized securities, cryptographic securities. Do you know what it's like for a certificate of designation for a preferred stock to be a cryptographic token with all the features and functionality in the certificate of designation? You know how much that saves? How much money that saves? We're Puts talking a lot of that trillions of dollars in operations gone, operational costs gone. This is a fight to the death. I'm well, sick and tired of being a bad guy. Nobody wants to listen to me. But almost every history is filled with examples of people fighting efficiency and market forces and efficiency, and they they put up fights for a long time. But eventually, the market wins, and uh, it may take you know a decade for another Supreme Court decision to help to help it out. But when things get more efficient because of technology advances, they almost always win. Listen, I never thought the day would come that I would be rooting for Ripple. <laughs> we all are <laughs> right yeah what on a, a, a quickly you you brought uh you brought up a topic uh earlier about um i should say i brought up a topic earlier that we sort of addressed yesterday that the cftc chair uh rostin benham uh, was directly asked is uh, ethereum a security and he answered that question uh no it's not. It's a commodity. And, he, and he, he gave a reason why. He said, because we did a thorough legal review. He said, we didn't just make a decision based on the feelings of the market. We did a thorough legal review uh, for it, and we believe it is not a, a security. Uh, it is a commodity. And we see the SEC comments of the past two days, including when they talked about all the other tokens on, uh, on Binance that were traded that they consider as security. They left off ETH, but they've not. They've never said, and they've never answered the question that Ethereum is not something that they uh, have the power to regulate. Uh, why? Why would you? Why is this happening? Why? Why? Why don't they agree on things like this? Or why? Why don't? Why is the SEC punting on it when the CFC, CFTC has said, "Hey, we've done a legal review. This is what it is." <coughs> There's going to come a time where Ethereum is a security. And the legal analysis that you'd have to draw has a lot to do with the number of staking nodes on the network and who runs those staking nodes, right? The fact is, if I delegate my ETH to Coinbase and stake it and let them handle the infrastructure, that is an investment contract. Now, many of you in the audience will say, no, it's not, but. It is. You're earning a return. Probably you're, is. you're expecting probably a return. Is, right? right. So you think banks don't want to be in that business? 
You think they don't want to be in that business? They want they want an unsecured loan from you and to give you piddlance back. So, well, what, what from that staking thing? I, I I found in the in the documents that were filed with Coinbase. Uh, let me rephrase that in the in the state of California, they're also ganging up on uh, on Coinbase. And they reveal that in the state of California, there are 644,000 residents of California staking on Coinbase. That's 3% of their population over the age of 18. Extrapolated to the US in general, it's about 10.4 million people staking on Coinbase. That's a massive amount of people staking for something that most people you stop on the street, they don't know anything about. But apparently 3% of the people have an account with Coinbase doing that. I, I find that, first of all, I find it hard to believe, but that's the numbers that was reported uh, in, in the legal documents. Maybe people are fronting for their friends in Asia and China and stuff, but uh, the, the point is they have a, a big a big presence in the state of California, in the United States, of people that are clearly not being defrauded because they're still being active, they're still actively staking. Yeah, uh, but you've this. got the state of Florida also, and the state of, uh, excuse me, the state of California. The state of California is one of the worst securities regulators of all 50 states, <laughs> right? By the way, something just came out. The court requests clarity from the SEC on Coinbase's request for clarity. <laughs> the SEC is going to point to the lawsuit that they just filed, right? The SEC has seven days to respond to a court's request for clarity on Coinbase's lawsuit against the regulator. The court overseeing the Coinbase v. SEC case, not to be confused with the SEC v. is seeking clarity on whether or not the SEC, with its legal action against Coinbase, will be denying the exchange its request for clarity. The court request comes after Coinbase filed a writ of uh, mandamus, essentially asking the court to oversee the commission's approach to regulating digital assets. Right. The SEC is now being asked by the court to respond to a few points within seven days. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but that just came out of Blockworks, right? Um, and just to, I want to give a, I don't know who wrote this. Uh, Catherine Ross wrote it. There's a guy, Byron Gilliam, great writes funny stuff sends the newsletter out every day and the headline it says hey bartender i'll take a few frosty pints of clarity for me and my pals here <laughs> anyway. so but yeah that's going to be interesting to see i i, I don't think it's going to have any legs the clarity. Well, they... Howie is the clarity. The 33 and the 34 Act is the clarity, right? Is it a thing that someone's expecting a rate of return on? Yes. Are they relying on the work of others? Yes. Is there a common enterprise? Maybe. But that's not as important a hurdle as, as the expectation of a return and the work of others reliance on the work of others right there's always five to ten people that someone who's buying a token is relying upon right uh, anyway are we out of time uh we we've uh, gone gone a little bit past an hour here We could go forever on these topics, but uh, we all have lives to get to. Uh, I know our listeners um, asked some good questions today. Um, as I tell, as I'm telling our uh, LinkedIn crowd and our YouTube crowd, uh, watching on the replay, if you get this far in the broadcast, drop some comments in, and we'll pay attention to them uh, and address it either on the ne next episode or as a reply in the comments. And if you're if you're an investor and you live in the United States tweet at Gary Gensler and ask him a question. Say, I am an investor who you are protecting. Will you answer the following question? And state your question. 
You hear you heard it here first, everyone. Let's bomb, let's bomb Gary Gensler's Twitter with actual questions. With actual questions, not <laughs> just these memes that keep coming across. It's hey, amazing. By all means, I mean, Twitter is now a uh, you know free speech platform. I, I, I got to gotta tell you, the, the internet is really the good at making. The versus Larry Flint governs the First <laughs> Amendment. That was the last <laughs> case at bar that fortified the worst people on earth's right to exercise free speech. Yep. Right? <laughs> and if you don't know the people versus Larry Flint, watch the movie, The People versus Larry Flint. It's a great, it's a great movie. And, and, and also, um, what's her name? Kurt Cobain's wife. It's a fantastic movie, and the soundtrack is incredible. Gary, this is blasphemous. <laughs> People are just br they're bringing religion into it. It's blasphemous. <laughs> oh, they, they, they could go on forever. I wish it was easier for them to show them on yeah. my screen because we could comment them all about it. You know what to do? Ask questions on my LinkedIn, right? Go to my LinkedIn uh if you can just put a, 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 a URL to my LinkedIn account and ask questions, I'll answer them to the best of my ability in a centrist way. I won't be sensational, but you know, I have 30 years of experience dealing directly with the SEC under their regulatory regime. Right? Well, lawyers, well, want well. lawyers want half your runway. That's the other thing. Why well, go straight into the front door of the SEC for a hundred grand or two hundred grand when they can get five million, pushing you over the edge and then lassoing you and saving you and saying, "See, I saved you," <laughs> which has happened to me a bunch of times in my career. But it's another story. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard the discussion today. Uh, like I said, if you've got more questions, uh, drop them for us. Uh, we'll have a follow-up event uh, sometime after this to learn how the London Society of Chartered Accountants FinTech event went. And, and I got to tell you, if there's anything live on the internet, I'll capture it. And uh, maybe we'll make a meme or two of Jason instead of uh, making fun of Gary Gensler. No, we won't, but we got to. You can. <laughs> you can. Free speech. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the UK soon will have their own version of, of Gary Gensler to be made fun of, and the, the EU is working hard at it also. Uh, but the world the world's piling on uh, on Mr. Gensler right now, uh, and they're they're wanting to see see him uh, resign. I don't know how how long does he go for before he has to be renewed in his job? Four or five years? It's a four year term, and he gets to get reappointed. Can, the can way, they be Harvey, fired? Harvey, Harvey Pitt just died. No, no, none of you may know Harvey Pitt. Some of you may know Harvey Pitt. He was the SEC chair during 9-11. Um, yeah. And then he, you know, uh, had a law firm and a consulting practice and worked for the, you know, went to the other side and made a ton of money. Anyway. Well, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, you heard it all today. You heard the good news, you heard the bad news, and you heard mostly bad news. But it's news we've been talking about for a while. Uh, as I say, Jason has been telling everyone, either here on this show or on LinkedIn, the rules are the rules, and the SEC has to follow them. And so these things will happen. Uh, and they did. Uh, and they did. It's going to take a lot to change them, uh, including um, everything from the, the Congress doing its thing to a Supreme Court doing its thing. But by that time, a lot of this business is going to be overseas and the U.S. will be missing out uh, on a lot of innovation, uh, and, which is unfortunate, uh, very, very unfortunate, because generally our market leads to very quick iteration of inno new innovative topics and we can come up with new things quickly. And other jurisdictions will see that, uh, which is which is sad, but anticipated. And you'll see, you're seeing companies like Coinbase now poking around the world. Hey, let's go operate somewhere else. But they can't escape the long arm of the SEC if they're an American corporation. So 
There's not much they can do about that. Jason, before we go, anything else you want to talk about? What's coming up? Things you want to mention for the uh, audience there? No, we'll touch base again after, uh, you know, one or two of these events. Right? One's tomorrow, then uh, next week. Right? Maybe we'll do another one of these next week. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we got for you this week. Uh, I'll be, if you're watching this live, I'll be live tomorrow morning on DYOR Live, which I will for sure recap some of this. So everyone, Jason, thanks for appearing. Good luck at the uh, events, and everyone have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.